Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give a sharing on this topic. Uh, for you, or those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Ryan Tan. I'm a medical oncologist from Singapore, practicing at the National Cancer Center. Um, currently, I'm now based at Memorial Sloan Kettering as a visiting investigator. And uh, I personally started dabbling in NLP in 2020. Uh, and that's when I came to know of uh, Spark NLP and the work John Snow was doing. And from there, uh, we've been doing a number of projects. Mostly, I was interested in um, research informatics and information extraction, how to structure unstructured information for purposes of cancer research. And so my presentation today will share my team's experience uh, using large language models and other NLP techniques in cancer data sets. And I hope they'll be useful uh, to you if you're also uh, involved in similar research and developing registries for cancer. So for the gender wise, I first start with our motivations of why we wanted to do this in the first place to understand and, and, and represent the patient journey better in data sets. And then key data points that we focused on, like radiology reports and the information we gleaned from there. And to more recent efforts, uh, assembling multimodal data sets, as well as current use cases, such as uh, clinical trial matching with uh, retrieval augmented generation LLMs. So to start um, at the uh, cancer centers, uh, like most academic institutions, we are working towards precision medicine in cancer. And to use um, on this particular research program as an example, um, we're trying to profile the patient's journey longitudinally by able, being able to accurately capture all the important time points in their journey, starting from when they were first diagnosed, were apparently well. In some cases, unfortunately, the disease may have come back at a certain time point, undergone some treatment with responses, and eventually sometimes reaching treatment failure. And the reason we want to do this is that at key time points, research programs may have collected specimens, but with such a high throughput and so many trials, you want to be able to accurately find you know, these key time points, key clinical information and samples. And the idea really is to pick the informative samples and time points to get early molecular readouts for key things like recurrences or resistance. And the idea with that, that can then inform research to deliver the right drug to the right patient at the right time to stop these progression events. So uh, we were, did a lot of this work as part of the clinical informatics and clinical cohort management, uh, which then led on to further downstream translational work in liquid biopsies, finding biomarkers, uh, developing uh, therapeutics and so forth. Uh, but our main objective when we first started is really to automate this information extraction process for the analysis of longitudinal cancer patient journeys. And so we thought about the data sources that uh, cancer research program would want to glean from free text, um, from free text. And um, I'm just going to share with you the models that we developed for radiology, but there are others as you can see here. So in a radiology report, the reason that we chose that um, as a start is because um, there was a very dedicated format uh, in our institution, it would start with a uh, brief history of the indication of the scan um, and it will go into the description of the findings that um, the radiologist describes what they see. It may reference uh, certain key images and it will always end off with a conclusion section summarizing the key findings to act on. And um, that may include things like a medical complication such as a thrombus uh, or blockage somewhere or a uh, thickening that may you know, uh, indicate some kind of response having decreased in size or number. So with these initial radiology reports, we thought key things that the research team would want to know are things like I just mentioned, complications, response to treatment or non-response to treatment, as well as sites of spread of the cancer called uh, metastasis. And so we, we started with various tools for annotation. Um, so Label Studio, what I'm showing here is one of them that we found you know, to be good and very user-friendly for annotating entities. In this case, uh, the annotator was annotating medical emergencies. Um, for simple things like just classification of the report, um, we found RedCap to be very useful. 
uh, and so we used it to classify uh, whether a patient was responding very well, uh, the disease was stable, or progressing on treatment. And when we needed to do more complicated annotations, such as uh, highlighting relations between words, um, we found Inception, another open source tool, uh, very useful for this, and you can see a screenshot of this there. Um, of course, uh, Spark NLP has its own uh, visualizers, and uh, we found this uh, very useful in the sense that uh, there was quite a lot of pre-trained libraries that uh, we could plug and play and then maybe do a bit of fine-tuning. And you can see here we did fine-tune it uh, for the categories uh, such as you know cancer imaging findings and then also the probability or the assertion, um, not just a simple binary assertion, but uh, almost uh, it did a few classes of uh, probabilities uh, for certain key terms. And this is a visualizer again from Spark NLP for relation ex extraction. Um, lastly, the last resource that I would share that we used um, for these projects, which was in the early 2021, 20, 2022, uh, was uh, Ubabuga. So Ubabuga is actually a Gradio web UI um, that we found useful for running various open source large language models at a time, such as uh, Llama 2. And uh, we would download the quantized models and then it, it would give a friendly user interface to, to try out uh, the models and then compare them uh, very quickly side by side. So here we're asking the model to, uh, to, to show us or to, to write out the sites of metastasis from a radiology report. And um, we, again, playing with prompts, uh, you get different, you can see that you get different responses just varying the different prompts and uh, there'll be other videos I'm sure uh, covering these which I won't cover for the interest of time. Um, so having gotten a sense of the kind of annotations and information that we wanted to get from the radiology reports, uh, we wanted to plug that into the cancer registry building mechanism and uh, using radiology reports as one of the key sources what we then did was uh, we would pair uh, the derived variable such as the disease response whether it was responding or progressing in particular we cared about scans which showed progression because that would mean that you know, the treatment's not working anymore and that date of the scan uh, we would infer as the date of progression of course, there's some minutiae, uh, which is why we always have a human in the loop, because sometimes patients may not have scans and have progress uh, with clinical progression or progression of blood markers. Uh, but to get quick readouts and to get that first pass in terms of large-scale data and in terms of the sense of how treatments were delivered over what periods of time, that was a key data point. And this is what we call progression-free survival, demonstrating uh, drug effectiveness or efficacy. And that gives us the real-world progression-free survival. And we could then use this to do other things, like get quick reads of uh, real-world effectiveness of various cancer drugs in various patient subgroups, identify outliers to, to pick informative samples. So it's not a foolproof 100%, but it would give us a first pass quick readout, which is something that currently doing manually would take would take months or weeks. So that was the first model we worked on, and it's been published in Jemaya last year, uh, and we turned it the disease response model. Um, so it first started with 20 over 1,000 reports, and after data cleaning ended up with 10,000 or so reports from uh, 1,740 patients from four tumor types, and we split it into a train development and test cohort. Um, you can see here that it was largely balanced uh, between the various uh, data sets. The only difference uh, I will point out was that the development at the test set had more stage four cases. But then when we went and looked in detail, that was because uh, this particular cohort that we picked uh, was largely made up of stage three patients, which subsequently recurred. So when you actually look at the class distribution of whether uh, they had no evidence disease, stable disease, response or progression, it's actually quite balanced between the cohorts because we actually took 
uh, scans across the entire patient journey. So if they're relapsed, you know, they, they would have all these other classes as well. And these uh, were two main findings from our results. So the first, we, we tried a whole range of uh, large language models and other more traditional NLP methods at the time. And you can see the slides refer to the paper. And the best performing models were generally the larger language models. And uh, in this case, it was those that was uh, uh, trained by NVIDIA in collaboration with medical institutions trained on medical records. And you can see that it reaches uh, accuracy levels close to 90%. And what we did to increase that accuracy was uh, a few techniques. So the first was we did data augmentation. And what we did here was uh, something called sentence permutation. So in a single original report, we would generate another 10 reports just by moving the different sentences around. And uh, by doing that, we get a much larger data set, training data set to, to, for the model to, to train on. And we also applied something called consistency loss. So what would be happening here would be the model would be comparing between the original report and the, and the augmented pair. And the probably this probability distribution of the four classes of responses uh, should be fairly similar because even though we jumbled up the sentences, the overall context and meaning is still the same. And within each sentence, it generally contains most of the information uh, you would need to, to derive uh, meaning from it. And so it'd be matching uh, to, that, to re representing these two probability distributions as two vectors. You're trying to match to find the closest uh, match. And that paired together with the augmented data set can eke out a bit more uh, improved performance or accuracy. The other thing we found out uh, using these experiments was that uh, using this particular prompt, we were able to reduce the number of reports in the training set quite significantly. With the full set being 8,500 or so, we could get reasonable performance uh, in terms of accuracy with prompt-based fine-tuning, even going down to about 500 reports. And this was the prompt that we used uh, shown here. So to then also help our end users uh, use uh, the predictions in a uh, more explainable way. Uh, we also used visualizations of weights here, assigning uh, darker colors to words assigned higher weights so that and you can see it generally makes sense in terms of classification with the word metastatic worsening increase uh, being words given higher weight in this report. So this gave us a lot of confidence to demonstrate the feasibility of this approach to derive these important variables. Large language models appear to be doing better than other methods and data augmentation uh, as well as prompt-based fine-tuning were both important uh, techniques that we found helpful. So going on to that, we then went to develop other models and this uh, was actually a, a model we used to detect sites of metastasis uh, and it's going to be in a manuscript uh, coming out in the JCO CCI soon. Um, here we took a different approach and we developed a pipeline. Um, we did play with large language models too, but the best performing uh, model was actually a Spark NLP pipeline that we use here. Uh, and we thought this was important because uh, when we were playing with the large language models, uh, it, it wasn't as consistent in terms of its um, replies uh, at that time. And that was important for us. And the other thing about this pipeline, breaking it down into uh, recognizing the entities, then assigning a probability, and then uh, extracting the high probability uh, entities with, with relation extraction, and then doing some processing was important to impart some degree of explainability as well. So you can see here, um, in this case, this is an example of uh, the various important chunks in the radiology report, where we would then pick out the key uh, entities, in this case, the anatomical body parts paired to words that imply metastasis, and then derive the final uh, model predictions. And you can see here, these were some of the models that we played with, and uh, the Spark NLP information extraction pipeline performed the best. 
um, we had a number of validation sets. So these were all trained on CT reports and we tried to see how transferable it was to other types of reports. There is some degree of transferability to other forms of reports like PETs and MRI. Um, but in these cases, actually the large language models perform better. And we think that that's because these reports may have slightly different wordings, like the PET CT scan may have uh, FDG, FDTE, MRI, may have um, T1, T2 contrast, and large language models being more versatile are able to incorporate some of these uh, new pieces of information that uh, a very rigid Spark NLP pipeline would not be able to do so uh, based on its prior training data. So, um, so we then used uh, these variables to enrich our cancer research databases. We did use it also to inform uh, our solutions as a module in the clinical trial matching pipeline and also to identify potential patients for oligometastatic interventions. So this is an example of uh, a UI interface that we developed for these models. So for um, research, we thought it was important also uh, to have a human in the loop and really verify some of these. And in the, our trainings, we also uh, did use some of this for ground truth annotations. Um, so you could see these are what Spark NLP visualizes, visualize and the user can choose to accept or reject a different comment as to whether why they agree or disagree with this. And then iteratively, we can use this to improve the models with larger training sets. Another thing that we did was as we were building more models, we then put them into a model repository classified based on the source of the data. So radiology bots, histology bots, clinical notes. And uh, what you can see here is that we allow the users to navigate to the model of interest, uh, upload a CSV file of the data set, run the model, uh, and then from there, they would get model predictions. And here we use a line visualizer to kind of highlight the word weights and how confident it was in its prediction. And again, users can choose to accept or reject. Uh, we also built simple models, regex models for other things, uh, which users also found uh, quite helpful. Lastly, uh, we then fed all these uh, into a dashboard that uh, the re clinical cohort uh, management team could use to pick up informative uh, patients and samples. So here you can see this uh, Tableau interface where the left side panel represents the entire cohort broken down by stage as well as uh, type of recurrence and whether they were still alive. And so uh, a research coordinator could pick a, co a sub cohort of interest, uh, such as, uh, for example, a stage three uh, cohort. Apologize, the video is uh, sagging a bit, but in this case, uh, generally, they, they could pick a cohort of interest and from that cohort, it would filter down into the types of treatments the patients had, the various lines of treatment they were in, and uh, metastatic sites. And on the right panel, you could see that they could select patients by uh, how long they were free of disease before a recurrence took place. So you could pick ex exceptional responders and you know uh, people who progress very quickly. And then having selected that particular uh, patient in the cohort, they could then see uh, a visualization of that patient's journey. And here you can see it's uh, various swim lanes uh, showing uh, di diagnosis at certain time points, um, the scans and the derived NLP uh, variables from there. And it would also show uh, you know, a simple recommender system of five other patients would be very similar to this profile. Um, moving on, I'd also like to share uh, things that my current institution is doing on this front. Um, and they've done this on a much larger scale. And you can see that uh, it started from their Center for Molecular Oncology, where using a C bio portal, they were collect systematically collecting samples of patients who had been profiled. 
a genomic leak. And you can see here, as of now, roughly it stands at about 1,200, uh, 120,000 samples from over 85,000 patients. And then also linking that with clinical data to form a very rich uh, resource for researchers available in real time. And this has led to a lot of uh, publications uh, for translational researchers. And moving forward, not just clinical and molecular data, things like digital pathology, images, lab values are all uh, being added on. So you can imagine this cube of data growing in terms of uh, the various types of data sources. And I think most cancer centers would aspire to do something very similar. Uh, and then having these uh, AI models do various tasks with them, such as clinical trial matching, predicting outcomes or treatment response based on this. And um, I think even though we have uh, a lot of aspirations everywhere to do things like this, it really uh, involves a, a large team. Um, of course, you could start off with a very small team, but it has to have uh, complementary skill sets from the clinical domain experts uh, to those with some technical expertise to help you do the data mining and then on the back end, the data engineering. And you can see here uh, for the MSK impact uh, databases, structuring that unstructured data, and having it flow through uh, and being combined together to get zero user copies is quite impressive. And so the visualizations are actually fairly similar um, again, you would have the patient journey represented in swim lanes. And the addition here would also be the layering of molecular data from the different samples at the bottom. Again, mouse over for more information so you save on valuable real estate in your dashboard. So to end off, uh, I would like to touch on uh, some useful use cases that you can use these databases for. And one of them exactly clinical trial matching. So this is some unpublished work that we've done trying to use uh, uh, RAG uh, large language models for clinical trial, trial screening. And I'll, I'll briefly go through some of them. Um, basically, we generated almost a thousand synthetic patient profiles and tried to match them to 184 trials using the each of the four large language models you see here, ranging from smaller ones like Zephyr to GPT-4. and uh, we wanted to increase the accuracy by having this retrieval augmented generation from a database with all the trial information inside. And briefly, uh, in the interest of time, you can see here that GPT-4 uh, by far uh, outperforms the rest of the models, reading accuracies of 95% you know, in the test set. And we had a smaller validation set, which was meant to be more challenging. And even then, it did about 80%. So we think that this is very promising and I'm sure you may hear uh, similar use cases in other talks in this meeting. Um, and so you should be encouraged to try some of this out for yourself. So to end off, I think this uh, really brings on a lot of possibilities for us in the healthcare field. You know, GPT-4 could do a lot of other tasks for us like summarization. Um, in this New England paper that Peter Lee and others uh, showed it was even able to correct some of the mistakes that was pointed out to it. Uh, and, you know, this really would lead us on in future to people aspiring to build multimodal foundation models to do not just one task, but a, a wide range of tasks, grounded radiology reports to note taking to chatbots. Um, so lots of potential um, models that can keep pace with new data coming in do a wider range of tasks, but also a lot of challenges for us in the field to figure out how to keep it explainable, how to validate um, its outputs when the task that is doing is increasingly complex, patient privacy, security, scaling. All these are challenges that we hope to meet together and discuss uh, in forums such as this. So to close, uh, I'd like to cite the late Henry Kissinger, Eric Smith and Daniel uh, Hutton-Locker where you know, generative AI can really facilitate summary and interrogation of the world's knowledge far more effectively than uh, other existing interfaces. But it also generates cumulative ambiguities. And you know, it does give a challenge to us to, to reach the level of understanding when it's always about 
probabilities rather than testing hypotheses uh, in a very systematic fashion. So we have to avoid automation bias and can we develop ways of really picking up errors uh, in answers. And so certainly we need to demand more. And as we roll these things out, be cautious and meticulous in assessing uh, and evaluating them. So uh, I'd like to credit the entire team for the work, particularly giving a shout out to Lo Guat Hua, who was uh, instrumental in a lot of the uh, data modeling analysis, engineering, Fan Lu Tan Tian with the preparation and Sibun for the project management and Ian for the sponsorship and my collaborator, uh, Professor Ng Gui To. So thank you very much and happy to take uh, any questions uh, from the audience. This was the last presentation today, and I'd like to thank all the speakers for their excellent talks covering state-of-the-art NLP and LLM applications in healthcare and in life science. Today's session highlighted the following takeaways. The healthcare GPT model benchmarks, the tra tra transformative impact of generative AI in drug discovery, advancement in diagnostic medical reasoning using LLM and AI systems, strategies for leveraging a healthcare NLP in medical centers, and a discussion of how we all as a community can work together towards responsible AI with the Coalition for Health AI. These discussions collectively offer very valuable perspective on enhancing healthcare outcomes through AI innovation. I would also like to say a big thank you to, uh, to all of you, to this amazing community, uh, to each one of you personally for joining and contributing with your own experience. See you tomorrow.